と聞いて。Hello Universe, welcome back to another episode of the Jones Chronicles. I'm your host, Christina. It is February. Well, February is almost over, but it's commonly known throughout the American states that this is Black History Month. I'm not a huge proponent of Black History Month, quote unquote, because learning Black history should be an everyday, every week, every month tradition. However, we all know that we as humans love creating occasions in which we want to mark certain, certain reminders of history. So this week was chosen in February, was started off as a week so that the black community could educate and celebrate their, their black community and their culture. Why am I saying they like I'm not a part of said culture? <laughs> But I guess I was going abstract when I started to initially explain. I do notice, however, a trend every time February comes along, we discuss our more notable figures who are indeed fascinating. Do not get me wrong. But I do think that there are other names that we can also bring and educate to the surface because we cannot allow the public school system with their 300 year outdated books to be the only source of knowledge that we get said information from. So I do want to. Discuss a few notable figures written by a collection of articles by different authors. Our first from Harmeet Kaur. Our first from Harmeet Kaur. Discussing Eunice Hunton Carter, who was a social worker and prosecutor whose investigative work in New York City. During the 1930s, led to what was then the largest prosecution of organized crime in U.S. history. When notorious mob boss Charles Lucky Luciano, yeah, that Lucky Luciano, Met his downfall, the credit went to the young prosecutor Thomas Dewey, who eventually ran for president. But it was Carter, an assistant district attorney on his team, who laid the foundation for the case. Carter was born in Atlanta, the granddaughter of enslaved people. In 1932, she became the first black woman to graduate from Fordham Law School at a time when few lawyers were black or women. Let alone black women. By then, Carter was already married to a dentist and had a son, but she had no interest in being a society mom. She soon became the first African American woman in New York State to serve as assistant district attorney, as the only woman on Dewey's team, which had been assembled to fight organized crime. She was re regulated to mostly prosecuting crimes against women. Such as prostitution. But while doing so, she discovered the brothels in New York were controlled by Luciano's mob, which received a share of their earnings in exchange for legal representation. Her painstaking investigative skills built the case against Luciano and led to his conviction in 1936. Later, Carter went into private practice and To a litany of other accomplishments, including a committee chair at the United Nations. Anyone who has ever had a blood transfusion owes a debt to Charles Richard Drew, whose immense contributions to the medical field made him one of the most important scientists. Of the 20th century. Drew helped develop America's first large scale blood banking program in the 1940s, 
earning him accolades as, quote, the father of the blood bank. Drew won a sports scholarship for football and track and field at Amherst College, where a biology professor piqued his interest in medicine. At the time, racial segregation limited the options for medical training for African Americans, leading Drew to attend med school at McGill University in Montreal. He then became the first black student to earn a medical doctorate from Columbia University, where his interest in the science of blood transfusions led to groundbreaking work separating plasma from blood. This made it possible to store blood for a week, a huge breakthrough for doctors treating wounded soldiers in World War II. In 1940, Drew led an effort to transport desperately needed blood and plasma to Great Britain, then under attack by Brittany during, you know, said war. The program saved countless lives and became a model for a Red Cross pilot program to mass produce dried plasma. Ironically, the Red Cross at first excluded black people from donating blood, making Drew ineligible to participate. What kind of bullshit is this? That policy was later changed, but the Red Cross segregated blood donations by race, which Drew criticized as, quote, unscientific and insulting. Drew also pioneered the Blood Mobile, a refrigerated truck that collected, stored, and transported blood donations to where they were needed. After the war, he taught medicine at Howard University and its hospital, where he fought to break down racial barriers for black physicians. And his story was written by Sidney Walton of CNN. You'll start to notice a trend as Amira Vera from CNN covers Josh Gibson. Although racism and fate kept him from the major leagues, Josh Gibson was one of the most dominant sluggers in baseball history. The former Negro League star is credited with hitting almost 800 home runs, over his 17-year career and was such a fearsome hitter that many fans called him the, quote, Black Babe Roof. Some who saw both play even called Roof the White Josh Gibson. Because of incomplete statistics, many of Gibson's legendary feats, like hitting a ball 580 feet at Yankee Stadium, are just that, the stuff of legends. Even his origin story is larger than life. He was reportedly a spectator at a Homestead Grays game in Pittsburgh in 1930 when the catcher hurt his hand. Gibson, already a semi-pro player, was invited to come down from the stands and replace him. He never looked back after that day. Gibson ultimately became the second highest paid player in the Negro Leagues behind another legend, Satchel Paige. I love how history is just all of a sudden... Mysteriously, our papers just disappear in the fire. Quote, you look for his weakness and while you're looking for it, he's liable to hit 45 home runs. End quote. Page once famously said of Gibson. Renowned player and coach Buck O'Neill called him, quote, the best hitter that I've ever seen. End quote. Unfortunately, Gibson never got the chance to play in the majors. He died of a stroke at the age of 35 in 1947, less than three months before Jackie Robinson made his debut for the Brooklyn Dodgers and broke baseball's color barrier. James Armistead's life would make a great movie. Under Lafayette, the French general who helped the American colonists fight for their freedom, he infiltrated the British army as a spy near the end of the Revolutionary War. I do think that in the AMC show Turn, there is a character based on James Armistead, if not actually his characterization. He once reported to Benedict Arnold, the traitorous colonist who betrayed his troops to fight for the British, and he provided crucial intelligence that helped defeat the British and end the war. Armistead was a slave in Virginia in 1781 when he got permission from his owner, who helped supply the Continental Army to join the war effort. Lafayette, who is fascinating in himself, dispatched him as a spy posing as a runaway slave. 
and he joined British forces in Virginia who valued his knowledge of the local terrain. Once he'd gained their trust, Armistead moved back and forth between the two armies, camps feeding false information to the British while secretly documenting their strategies and relying them or relaying them to Lafayette. His most crucial intel detailed British General Charles Cornwallis's plan to move thousands of troops from Portsmouth to Yorktown. Armed with this knowledge, Lafayette alerted George Washington and they set up a blockade around Yorktown, which led to Cornwallis's surrender. Virginia lawmakers, after lobbying by Lafayette, granted Armistad his freedom in 1787. His owner, William Armistad, paid his 250, uh, was paid 250 pounds, because that's how they did it in British society. Once your slave was granted freedom, the tax dollars reimbursed you. So you were never out any money, which is ridiculous because you shouldn't have owned them to begin with. Armistad married, raised a family, and spent the rest of his life as a free man in his own uh, Virginia farm. He added Lafayette to his name as a token of gratitude to the French general. This article comes to you by Faith Karimi. Our next story comes from Allah Alasser. The son of two former slaves, Garrett Morgan, had little more than a grade school education, but that didn't stop the Ohio man from becoming an inventor with a rare gift for designing machines that save people's lives, including an early version of the traffic light. As a teenager, Morgan got a job repairing sewing machines, which led him to his first invention, a revamped sewing machine, and his first entrepreneurial venture, his own repair business. Soon he was inventing other products, including a hair straightener for African Americans. In 1916, he patented a safety hood, a personal breathing device that protected miners and firefighters from smoke and harmful gases. It became the precursor of the gas masks used by soldiers during World War I. I'm wondering if the hair straightener he made was the device in which my mom used to put on the stove and burn the living shit out of my ear, no matter how much I held that bitch down when she was doing my hair. Those are some very greasy, uncomfortable memories because she would always be chewing on some fucking ice too for some reason. To avoid racist resistance to his product, Morgan hired a white actor to pose as the inventor while he wore the hood during presentations to potential buyers. Later, after witnessing a car and buggy crash, Morgan was inspired to create a traffic light that had three signals, stop, go, and stop in all directions to allow pedestrians to safely cross the street. It also had a warning light, now today's yellow light, to warn drivers they would soon have to stop. His traffic light was patented in 1923, and Morgan eventually sold his design for $40,000 to none other than General Electric. His legacy can be seen today at intersections across the country and the world. And I thought that was one of the most interesting stories that I learned out of all of them because it's still so relevant. Not to say that the others weren't, but, you know, I don't, I don't get too many blood transfusions. Activist Marsha P. Johnson helped pave the way for transgender youth thanks to her fearless belief in speaking truth to power. And she did it in style, complete with flower headpieces and lavish outfits, which were often thrifted or gifted from friends. Her name even radiated attitude with her saying the P stood for pay it no mind. Despite describing herself as, quote, nobody from Nowheresville, she took part in what would become a catalyst for the LGBTQ plus movement. 
1969, she played a key role in the uprising against police at a popular gay bar in New York City in what became known as the Stonewall Uprising. Quote, we were just saying no more police brutality and we had enough of police harassment in the village and other places. She told historian Eric Marcus in an interview in 1989. Often suffering from homelessness herself, Johnson went on to launch the group Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries as a way to offer houses to homeless and transgender youth. Tragically, in 1992, her body was found floating in the Hudson River and the circumstances around her death remain unclear. Police initially ruled it as a suicide before reopening her case, and it remains a mystery to this day. That said, it's widely known that transgender people are often targets of violence. Last year, the Human Rights Campaign said that deaths of trans and gender nonconforming hit an all-time high of 32, and of those, people of color account for 81% of those victims. So while she was definitely brave in her time, it shows we still have quite a lot, particularly in the Black community, regarding tolerance to learn and accept. Lastly, I want to end on a topic that Shai brought up a couple of weeks ago on our our jamming session that is something that is relevant today that is being taken away, but is still very much misunderstood, and that is affirmative action. While we would all love to believe that as a society, we have moved beyond the legacy of segregation, which necessitated the creation of affirmative action, we cannot ignore the evidence of persistent discrimination and structural inequalities in American life. Numerous studies also indicate that when people of color apply to college, they are subject to racial discrimination built into the selection process. For instance, colleges and universities take into account an applicant's standardized test scores and whether or not the high school student attended was an elite school. Yet studies have proven that the SAT is biased towards the wealthy white males and that people of color are far less likely to have access to well-funded elite high schools than their white counterparts mainly because those white high schools have better materials, updated books, uh, access to, to more study groups, to more, just more money being given to the education. Colleges and universities realize that judging a candidate based only on such criteria is discriminatory. Indeed, this accounts for why they have developed affirmative action programs to begin with. Standardized tests fail to measure human capacity in any field. In this respect, it is not surprising that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., one of the most brilliant orators in the 12th century, scored very low on the verbal section of the SATs. And I'm sure many other famous people would also reflect that this, what's that supposed to mean for me that I scored higher on the SATs? (laughs) Uh, I digress. How did affirmative action come to be? Throughout history, legal restrictions were used to exclude all women, especially black women and other women of color, from many high paying jobs, which were reserved exclusively for white men. Over time, these formal restrictions have diminished, but some black women are experiencing occupational segregation where they are being steered into and disproportionately hold jobs that offer lower wages. I think someone else that I respect made a comment that isn't racist or wasn't trying to be racist because they're not racist, but was one of those ignorant comments of, well, someone brought up why is there no black people on the team? 
we just picked the best players. So clearly, if they're all white, that must mean they're all the best players. It's like, no, when you have a systemic way of judging people, you can't, like, you're just saying that because you're that's what you feel the world should be, right? And you think that that's what's happened. But behind the scenes, unfortunately, that's just not the case. You you can't simply say that a group of all white athletes got there only based on their merits because it simply doesn't even add up mathematically that there would not be any black counterparts. (laughs) And we're talking about African Americans, right? Who females who are who are statistically known to be, you know, one of the the survivors to be born into the world. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy signed Executive Order 10925, which compelled government contractors to, quote, take affirmative action to realize the national goal of non-discrimination, end quote. Many U.S. colleges and universities were later galvanized to develop affirmative action admissions policies in the 1970s following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. Before this, students of color were banned from attending, quote, white higher education institutions in southern states. They were instead regulated to less well-funded and less prestigious historically black colleges and universities. That's why I'm not down for let's just go to all the black colleges and universities because they're not getting the funds that that the other white universities are getting, simply put. Even in northern states where the ban did not technically exist, white students were heavily favored in admissions. Black students who managed to gain admission experienced overt discrimination in nearly all predominantly white colleges and universities. Kennedy's order recognized the systemic nature of racism in the U.S. and its far-reaching impact on the well-being of generations of non-white Americans. Related policies in higher education admissions, by extension, recognize that young people of color often don't have the same socioeconomic and academic advantages as their white counterparts in the years leading up to college. One example of this is the high cost of SAT prep programs, which can significantly boost test scores for students whose parents can afford and facilitate them. As race conscious policies, affirmative action admissions seek to address the fact that inequality in society as a whole creates multiple race related barriers to graduating from high school and attending college for non-white students. They attempt to mitigate these systemic barriers to higher education by allowing race to be one factor among many others as college admissions faculty evaluate applications. What are the impacts of affirmative action? Well, between 1966 and 1976, the total number of American Black students enrolled in colleges and universities leap from 282,000 to an encouraging 1,062,000 as a direct result of affirmative action admissions policies. This has been a major driver of reducing poverty among African Americans, making middle class Black Americans the latest economic segment of the larger demographic. However, all states do not support affirmative actions. Eight have recently banned the practice, and we'll later talk about what the Supreme Court has recently ruled. Here's the thing. People often associate affirmative action with efforts to end discrimination for people of color. But scholars say the greatest beneficiaries of affirmative action policies are white women from college campuses to the American workplace. Discussions about affirmative action tend to focus on race, but statistics show that it also had been an equalizer for white women in education and in the workplace. 
A Labor Department report in 1995 found that since the 1960s, affirmative action had helped 5 million members of minority groups and 6 million women move up in the workplace. The beneficiaries of affirmative action are stigmatized for the very same reasons that these policies exist in the first place. Persistent and sometimes unconscious beliefs that women and people of color are simply less talented, hardworking, and competent than their white male counterparts. In this regard, affirmative action beneficiaries are easy to stigmatize because our culture is already loaded with negative stereotypes. And I am talking about the black culture, about the abilities of women and the people of color. But here's an example of how white women used affirmative action. When the A8 small business program was established in the 70s, Congress wouldn't allow it unless white women were allowed to participate. Ultimately, it was used by white men to maintain complete control of government by using their wives as proxies to keep blacks out. Let me guess, white devil, white devil. What did Bill Burr say? How dare you white women throw my white privilege in my face like you ain't in the jacuzzi with me. <laughs> like you weren't doing your dirt while I was doing mine. Like we ain't been working in this together. So here is the question. If white women have historically been both the beneficiaries of affirmative action efforts and its biggest detractors, why are we not interrogating them on what the most recent Supreme Court ruling banning affirmative action for college campuses mean instead of black people being made to answer for a system that that we are not the only beneficiaries of. Of course, one could say this is about race and not gender, but clearly when you go to the definition of what affirmative action was meant to do and how white women have benefited from that, why are they on that side of the fence? And where has been the catalyst of the most recent ruling? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is what I, what we've all been saying that's been paying attention for a while. It's anti-blackness and efforts to halt black access to advancement. We have to take the suffering. <laughs> To carry out that mission, whiteness will use any means necessary, including deputizing white women and in the case of the recent ruling, Asian minorities to carry out that mission. In 1995, a report by the California Senate Government Organization Committee found that white women held a majority of managerial jobs compared with other racial and ethnic groups. A Department of Labor report from the same year found that 6 million women overall had job advances that would not have been possible without affirmative action. I think we already brought that up. White women have also been at the forefront of the major Supreme Court affirmative action cases, challenging the policy and advocating for a merit-based system. Here's the thing. How many times we've been in the office and the dumbest one around is your boss, who is a white woman... And you sitting here doing her job and your job, yet she's the one getting paid all of the money, getting the recognition and continuing to move up the ladder. How many black women in corporate America have sat there and watched that story happen? So you can kiss my ass with merit based system because you didn't inv invent one. You didn't. A prime example is the case of Abigail Fisher, a white woman who sued the University of Texas, Austin, arguing that her rejection from the university was due to less qualified students of color taking her spot. Even though other students, both white and of color, with lower scores than Fisher, 
were accepted and even Fisher had received a perfect personal achievement score, she would not have necessarily qualified under UT's admission rubric. Despite such cases, the assumption that affirmative action undermines merit is deeply flawed. It's important to note that white women have greatly benefited from this policy and their dis- and their advancement does not necessarily denote that they were more meritorious candidates over those from other racial and ethnic backgrounds. For instance, a sociological study in 2009 revealed that white applicants were three times more likely to be admitted to selective schools than Asian applicants with the same academic record. By focusing on the reactions of Black people, the discourse makers in the media reinforced the misframing that affirmative action was exclusively supposed to and does give Black people a leg up. This narrative has led to non-Black people claiming that Blacks who exist in elite spaces are inherent thieves that we have, quote, stolen a spot from a white woman or another, quote, model minority. In not interrogating these truths, white women get to benefit from innocence and their favorite thing, victimhood. I don't even want to play this game with you anymore. If you don't believe me, watch all the Karen videos once they get confronted and find out they in the wrong. A decrease, it's not all gloom and gloom though. Decreasing the unemployment rate of black women is heartening, but labor experts warn that the trend shouldn't create any false notions about equity in the workforce. The unemployment rate for the entire black population has avoid, avoided ticking up since August coming in at 5.4% in January, according to the seasonally adjusted data released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics on Friday. January's drop by or in black unemployment was propelled by gains made by black women whose unemployment rate, excluding teenagers, dropped to 4.7% in January from 5.5% in December. Black men, by comparison, saw unemployment tick up to 5.3% in January from 5.1% in December. And I don't know (laughs) if this is the podcast to really go into our conversation about that. Both the rate of unemployment for all Black people and for women specifically are at their lowest level in more than a year. The last time the Black unemployment rate was below 5.5%, was in September of 2019, while Black women last had a sub 5% unemployment rate in November of 2021. In June of 2023, uh, Black women's labor force participated had rebounded to 62.9% among the highest of any group of women compared to 59.3% in April of 2020. And that's why white women are panicking. However, black workers remain one of the most exploited groups in the U.S. labor force, comprising 47% of workers that earn less than $15 an hour, often without worker protections. Women, especially women of color, are disproportionately represented in low-wage jobs with 40% of working women and 50% of working women of color earning less, as stated, than $15 as well. Black women's work has been undervalued and disrespected by society, never mind that it was our milk nourishing your baby's health. During the era of shadow slavery, Black women generated wealth for the U.S. economy, but were systematically denied to rights. As I alluded to, the U.S. Supreme Court made a significant ruling holding that race-conscious admissions programs at institutions like Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. This ruling effectively eliminates the ability of colleges and universities to use affirmative action to achieve a racially diverse student body, marking a substantial change in the landscape of higher education. While some may think, okay, well, this this at least harms white women (laughs) as well as, as 
Black and Latino students. However, it only magnifies the institutional inequality faced by people of color. Despite significant strides in bridging racial achievement gaps, stark disparities persist in access to quality education, resulting from a myriad of factors like school funding, teacher quality, and social socioeconomic circumstances. Yeah, college is not free. It sure shit ain't cheap either. So being able to get access to certain programs that affirmative action put in place to help benefit the less advantaged, that's no longer taken away. So now those women don't have access, whereas data and research have validated time and time again that the legacy of legal and illegal racial discrimination in the United States has put most people of color at a disadvantage starting point compared to their white counterparts. This is referred to as the equity myth with a, with affirmative action policies in place, these students had at least a fighting chance of accessing higher education and the myriad opportunities it affords, despite the odds stacked against them. It's recovation or revocation effectively turns the clock back on these hard won games. On the flip side, this ruling disproportionately benefits white students, reinforcing the racial status quo in higher education, even though they turn out dumb as fuck. It further entrenches their privilege by dismissing the systemic advantages they've historically enjoyed. They stand to gain from a, quote, colorblind admissions process, which will likely uphold the disproportionate representation of white students in elite institutions. It's more like, no, this is really set in place. So now you no longer have your better merit to get in on that is no longer good enough. Our white privilege is losing privilege. It's losing, it's losing stock. It's losing value. So now we have to find ways to, to up our value once again. Because we can't sure shit do it on our own merits. And it's not to say all white people, but we know, we know those ones keeping themselves only so smart where, you know, maybe, maybe there could be some changes, some innovation that might be too hard for you to catch up with. America still has a long way to go before all the vestige of Racial discrimination are eliminated. And to say otherwise is being naive. Just because you're tired of the topic doesn't mean the topic's going away. Doesn't mean it, it's changed because you don't see it around where you are. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Despite what colorblind advocates may wish to be the case, race still creates a host of economic and social burdens shared by people of color across all classes. These burdens reflect the extra costs associated with being non-white, and are often referred to as the black tax or the brown tax. These burdens may differ from community to community. However, all people of color, even the most privileged, face varying degrees of racial discrimination in housing, schools, the workplace, and almost everywhere else in the United States. Yeah, like I, I can have a credit score of 780, be at my job 10 years, making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year. But if they see black on my application and they're not looking for black people, I can be pushed aside and I, I, I there's nothing that protects me from that. Class, of course, remains a significant barrier for many Americans of all races, yet critics who would suggest that, for instance, poor whites and non-whites face exactly the same problems, are minimizing the racial differences that characterize their experiences of poverty. And I was reading from several articles listed below. Please check out the links for the full articles and give credit to the authors for their outstanding work that I am just sharing and learning with you together on our journey, our continuing journey to higher enlightenment. If you have any thoughts, ideas, feedback, blackercouch at gmail.com. 
as I stated, you don't need February to start looking into your history, to start educating yourself about the black experience, not just in America, but all across the world. Because there are a lot of interesting experiences and perspectives out there. So definitely seek it, ingest it, and see how it reflects in your own life. Until next time, peace, hair grease, and black magic. Ooh.